West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com I'm joined now by Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was once Russia's richest man. In the early years of Putin's reign, Khodorkovsky became a prominent critic of the Kremlin before he was imprisoned for fraud and tax evasion, charges he says were politically motivated. He was released in 2013 and has been living outside Russia since then. Welcome, Mikhail Khodorkovsky. But before we begin, I want people to understand why I think you have real insight into how the Kremlin works. In 2003, you were the richest man in Russia. Uh, brilliant businessman, you had run a whole bunch of businesses. Um, and then you start criticizing the regime. And you say you may run against Putin for, in, for president. Within six months, your company has been taken away from you, the largest company in Russia. You are in prison and you spent 10 years in prison. Uh, and the company is taken away through a complicated series of maneuvers where they claim tax fraud and stuff. So you know how Putin operates um, and who has power in that system. Is it possible that the oligarchs have enough power that they can pressure Putin to change course, to withdraw from Ukraine? Uh, it, uh, this is a mistake. Uh, a mistaken pre presumption about how Russian power is arranged. Russian power is not an oligarchy. It's a dictatorship. And the oligarchs are merely, actually, not oligarchs, but merely agents of the Kremlin who are used by the Kremlin as a tool. So there is no feedback in the other direction to influence the dictator. They, they cannot do that in a in practical sense. Um, what about uh, the military or uh, other parts of the, uh, the ruling elite, maybe the, uh, the KGB, what is now the FSB? Or are the intelligence services or the army, does anyone have power other than you know, Putin? He calls himself the vertical of power. Is there anybody outside of that vertical of power? Most likely, it's, it's not so much a, a vertical of power, it's Putin power. Putin holds on to power by uh, taking parts of the, of the people around him and, and setting them off against each other. Of course, there are people that do have some influence on his mental perceptions. People such as Yuri Kovalchuk and those people who are around uh, Yuri Kovalchuk. And of course, the military can tell Putin, and they are indeed telling him now, that we, in current conditions, cannot do the task that we've been assigned. And Putin has to take that into account. But the decision is made by him, of course. So what is the way to pressure Russia 
to get serious at the negotiating table. Unfortunately, no other advice can be given here other than the courage of the Ukrainians and the sanctions that undercut the opportunities for Putin to buy new weapons and to hire mercenaries. So only force. Putin will only understand if there is pressure, if there is resistance from Ukraine, if there are sanctions from the West. Unfortunately, he's that kind of a person. All his life, he's always dealt with uh, the criminal elements and was indeed himself part of that criminal world. He doesn't treat the law seriously, he, uh, or state institutions for that matter. In his world, the main thing is force. And if you don't show him force, if he senses that you're weak, as he does, for example, about Mr. Macron, he simply takes advantage of you. When he feels force, when he's afraid of force, he's ready to talk. A lot of people have criticized Joe Biden for saying that he wished uh, uh, Vladimir Putin were no longer in power. Um, the argument is you have to negotiate with him. Uh, you're going to have to sign a deal with him. Uh, and so this would complicate things. How do you see it? I have also done a lot of criticizing of Mr. Biden, but from a different perspective. I think that his words are absolutely correct and very important. First of all, they're important because people in the world, all over the world, are waiting, are expecting an ethical assessment from the leader of the free world. And when this leader gives this ethical assessment, that is important. His assessment that such people should not be in power. It's understandable that only the Kremlin and maybe the White House interpreted these words as Mr. Biden being ready to personally remove the Russian president. Everybody else understood it correctly. It was an ethical assessment. Russians are going to remove the Russia's president. Another second important thing is that Mr. Putin perceives an, uh, uh, and this approach uh, w without the show of force as weakness. And so when Mr. Biden said that uh, using weapons, that there's going to be an appropriate response to the use of weapons of mass, response, uh, mass destruction, that's not a provocation for Putin. That, that's something that, that, that puts brakes on his, on his desires. And on the other hand, when Mr. Schultz or Mr. Macron says that, that, that there's no way uh, that we should uh, take part in uh, a clash with, uh, with Putin's uh, forces, that actually encourages Putin to use weapons of mass destruction. This is a, a fundamental lack of understanding of the un, uh, mentality of a person who ha, has, has been among criminals all his life. So Putin is now facing obstacles in Ukraine. Um, what, given what you know of his mentality, what is he going to do? Is he going to, is he going to turn Ukraine into Chechnya, destroy it? Is he going to back, back away? What do you think his options are? For him, the situation today is very complicated. At first, what he wanted was to uh, change the power in Kyiv, put in his puppet, and was expecting that, that this would be met with flowers thrown in the streets by Ukrainian people. When this did not happen, he went crazy. The fact that the people in Kharkov did not meet him with flowers, uh, it not only just angered him, I really think it, it drove him literally insane. That's when he started bombing Kharkiv and Kiev. Right now he has three options that face him, uh, three ways out. First way out is to continue pressuring Ukraine. Um, 
and probably losing troops in, in, in this process because the Ukrainians are fighting back ever more strongly with every day. Secondly, he could use weapons of mass destruction in the hope that this would force the Ukrainians to retreat. And the third option is to start actual negotiations. When Mr. Biden, when NATO officials say that in one voice that if Mr. Putin use, if you use WMDs, you will get an appropriate response from NATO. That actually gives Putin only one choice to sit down for real at the negotiating table. Let me ask you, um, we're not thinking a lot about this, but if Putin somehow comes out of this stronger, if the Ukrainians have to concede uh, on a number of issues, do you think he has greater ambitions that he could at some point um, attack the Baltic states or Poland? We must understand that in his head, Putin is at war not with Ukraine. He's at war with, with the United States and NATO. He said this more than once. His propagandists have already been pre started to prepare Russian society for an attack on NATO countries. They're constantly talking about this, and this is the preparation of Russian public opinion for this. I am absolutely convinced that if Putin decides that, uh, that he has won in Ukraine, this is not going to be the last step, the last war. The next steps will be the Baltic countries. I've always wanted to ask you this question because I figure you probably can answer it better than almost anybody. Um, what do you think Vladimir Putin is worth in terms of the, all the money he has been able to take out of Russia personally? For a long time, Putin was a person that was money-oriented. But as with many elderly criminals, he now has a mission in his head. And that is actually way more scary. His mission, under which he has to show the whole world that he is great, that he is leaving the world a legacy. That's a lot scarier w w than when he was just uh, gathering money. Right now, I think money is not going to stop him. It is Monday, the 4th of April of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. Yes, uh, this is the day that a lot of establishments are closed. And uh, those that remain open have a little bit left over from the weekend. And what we do is that we reconstitute that into a lovely gourmet dish for your, well, virtual gourmand delight. Yes. If you're a gourmand already, everything about food is delightful to you. Hey, uh, there's a lot of food insecurity in uh, a Slavic country right now. And I think maybe making jokes about our abundance might be uh, a little off pudding um i i don't want us to get tired of what is going on in ukraine to the point that we just don't want to hear about it anymore but i have to confess um it's i i i never really like looking at cadavers dead bodies in the middle of the road I, it's just not something that I, I'm i uh, drawn to, shall we say, to scrutinize. I can see it a couple of times. I really don't need to see it anymore, but it needs to be seen. Ah, uh, so, um, and we could say, well, you know, I don't need to look at it because they're just preaching to the choir. I already know that we need to do something, but I think our complacency will set in. There are going to be a lot of people out there who just don't care. And I think maybe they need to be shocked on a regular basis. Because apparently 
when you have, for instance, now this might seem far afield, quite a jump, but I noticed Disney uh, stock is down. Now, is that because of DeSantis causing his minions to do whatever? Is it just the volatility in the market because DeSantis is causing the volatility? What is it? I've always been a believer that you can't really look at the ups and downs of the stock market and assign it to one particular dynamic. There's many dynamics that go on in the midst of it. I think that coming off a pandemic and seeing a resurgence of some variants to the point where there's countries around the world right now locking down again. Could investors see a volatile market because there might be less tourists going to the Disney properties? Or is it because Disney is woke? Jesus Christ. I said repeatedly over the weekend, if you're so far to the right that you think Disney is woke, you are a Nazi. And you look at DeSantis and everybody goes, you know, you're right. <laughs> Talk about cancel culture. <laughs> you know, if people if people spoke against him, if people wanted to really say, for instance, actual covid numbers from the health department, they went after that lady and accused her of a computer crime because she was working on a computer to as part of her job to compile these numbers as they came in. You put the number in this cell, you put the number in that cell, and then the computer does its calculations. And for that, they hounded her and continue to hound her to this day. Nazis do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh... I know people say they're not really part of the Nazi party. Well, I'm not talking about the Nazi party. <laughs> I'm talking about a frame of mind. And fascism is one way of putting it, but I like Nazi. It rolls off the tongue better. It has a certain teutonic edge to it that we can ridicule and mock. That's why. All right. Ah. <sighs> So, can you tell that I'm a little peeved? Yeah. When there's a massacre and a genocide going on, it, uh, you know, kind of riles one up. Hard to forget. I'd like to. I'd like to not see all of those dead bodies. I just don't linger on it. I can't. It's one of the reasons why, uh, when I was in the medical field... Ever so beginning aspect of it. I mean, I was an orderly and and whatnot. My sister, as you know, or don't know, but uh, she put in quite a few years. She just retired this year, so, wow, 40-some years of being a nurse. 25 of those were spent in pediatric pediatric oncology at Children's Hospital in Orange County takes a particular kind of soul I call them angels to be able to do that because I couldn't I just couldn't I didn't have the emotional makeup to deal oh no at the in the moment you know, whether there's blood and gore and you have responsibilities to fulfill, you do them. I mean, that's you're just doing that. But then I could not keep from taking it home with me. I could not stop the, the visualizations of what I had experienced. I could not stop feeling sorry for the poor people who were in that predicament. I just couldn't. And they all started piling up. And it got harder and harder and harder to deal. And I thought, well, maybe this isn't my career. <laughs> maybe this isn't something I, I, I am capable of doing. I throw my hands up and say, okay, I give in. I don't have the emotional makeup to do this. I've tried. And the amount of distancing and compartmentalization is too much. I, I just can't do it. 
So I chose another path. Uh, though I will assure everyone that in a time of need, I am known to uh, put together quite a good field dressing. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't do it day after day after day as, uh, you know, as my job. Wait to get my paycheck at the end of the week. Oh, yeah, okay. A little bit different than flipping burgers or T-bones, depending on where you're at. In your in your avoidance strategy. <laughs> so, we didn't keep ourselves from knowing about all those dead in Vietnam on both sides. I just could not linger on those bodies. I could not watch that Buddhist monk self-emulate. Couldn't. I see the picture to this day and I have to turn away. I still remember it when I first saw it, and I think it was Life Magazine. We used to get Look. Remember Look? And Life Magazine. I love those magazines. So, um, what is happening now with Russia's imperialism, because this is exactly what it is, it needs to, uh, I, I think we need to be a little bit more forceful, shall we say, in our rhetoric, at least. If not actual munitions, armaments, and, I don't know, maybe a few, uh, you know, uh, advisors. On the ground advisors, maybe not, but, you know, a few more uh, military advisors. Maybe. That sounds so warlike, I hate the idea of it, but you know what? <laughs> I don't think turning the other cheek's going to work. They're just going to cut your head off. Jesus, and grind you up under the tank tracks, which they did to a bunch of women. And I believe I believe it was Bucha. It might have been Kharkiv. Can't look at that. And there is documented photographic evidence, So, but I'm just saying. Hearing about it is brutal enough. Um, so I had a line of thought there that I wanted to, uh, finish up, but it's just enough to say that we cannot get complacent in the midst of this because the 40 days that we have been experiencing this and, uh, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe the networks, you know, the cable news shows are, are doing this just because, you know, the ratings. At some point, the ratings are going to tank. People are want to, you know, watch, I don't know, the equivalent, uh, equivalent of Petticoat Junction to keep their minds off of what's going on over there. Just like back in the day when Petticoat Junction was on. <laughs> How did I ever think Petticoat Junction was a way for us to keep our minds off Vietnam? Because it was. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> It worked. Yeehaw! And Petticoat Junction, I consider to be the uh, demarcation point for, you know, the really rapid fall into where we are now. Yeah, we can't let ourselves get complacent about this. And I fear that when the ratings start tanking and they're going to be compelled to not have it on our TVs, not have it reported as much, um, that could be a big mistake. We've already experienced this before with this same guy. And now, it literally is getting a little bit too close to home because the thread that I was trying to finishing up, finish up with is that there is such a similarity to what Vladimir Putin is purporting to be reality and what Donald Trump was trying to foist upon the United States of America. Thank God our opposition is more than theirs, than their, their authoritarian BS. A little bit different over in Russia, okay? Their opposition is minuscule compared to the brainwashed masses. 80 plus million voted against this guy because 
some of us, I got to say, now just bear with me, it might sound a little elitist, even coastal. But I think with the proper critical thinking skills that those of th- those of us who have developed those over time, and dare I say that I'm going to be so, um, I don't know, narcissistic to include myself in that number, I think those folk are less likely to be brainwashed. It is a struggle. And part of not being able to be brainwashed is to constantly analyze whether you are being brainwashed. That's what critical thinking skills are supposed to, I don't know, extend to your uh, ability to analyze (laughs) and make a decision. Because it's not enough just to analyze the situation. A decision has to be made. And that's why I use the rhetorical flourish of you gotta punch the Nazis. If you just stand back and let the DeSantis's of the world and the Vladimir Putin's of the world and dare I say even the Victor Orbans, yeah, he just got himself elected to another 12-year term. How that happened? You can, you can guess that it's all part of the same playbook that we've seen here, we've seen in Vladimir Putin's Russia since he took it over. So, yeah, Victor Orban's win is fake. And that's going to cause a big problem in the EU since Victor Orban's part of them. So um, the the playbook, the rhetoric, the strategy of just out and out lying, the reality being so singular to this particular person in his little bubble. And no matter what you say, it doesn't work. And if you say anything that runs counter to his belief, you will have you'll be under worse than house arrest. Let's put it that way. I love how they say, oh, yeah, one of these oligarchs is under house arrest. Where? Oh, well, he's in a house in a gulag. It's it's, it's, it's his house now. Yeah. House arrest. A little bit of polonium poisoning causing your face to swell up. Jeez. And I, I, I don't put it past personages here in our country who uh, would look at that as like something, you know, they would like to do. In fact, I think they're really praying to whatever God it is that they pray to to make it so. All right. It's Monday. I think I have really, really ranted. I I actually put together a curated show because this salon has, you know, a a little bit of curation. (laughs) A little bit. So why don't we go ahead and tell you what has been curated? Yes. At the top, an ex-Russian oligarch says that when Vlad's troops were not met with flowers, that was the one moment in the war that drove Putin insane. And see what I mean? On the rest of the menu, black Democratic candidates try to revive the party in Trump territory. An Applebee's franchisee worker was fired over a leaked email speculating on high gas prices and also uh, the, the pandemic stimulus funds ending. Will force employees to work longer hours for less money. He, yeah, he got fired for that. And new vehicles sold in the U.S. will have to average at least 40 miles per gallon of gasoline by 2026. And I would say make it sooner, but that's just me. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Lithuania cut itself off entirely of gas imports from Russia over the weekend. See, it can be done. And the Muslim holy month of Ramadan began at sunrise Saturday. Just as Russia's invasion of Ukraine sent energy and food prices soaring even higher. Welcome to Monday. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
page at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. Across the page from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is a link to our Patreon site. And do please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. We need the money. And I'm not joking. That's no April Fool's joke. We do no pranks here at Netroots Radio. And if you could afford to send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink once a month, it helps us pay our bills. And yes, we need the money. And thank you for those of you who have been so very generous over all these many years. 11 years of continuous 24-7, 365 resistance broadcasting. Thank you for letting us fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's at 10, about 10 minutes before showtime. So you can get the show notes and links there or find uh, at Justice Putnam on Twitter and then they'll, you'll find the link for that there. Yeah. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. Pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, wherever podcasts can be found. And, of course, uh, the Netroots Radio Library, the Deep Archive, can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Look for Netroots Radio. Okay, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fine River City Hash Mondays, fine, is by Andrew DeMilo out of the Associated Press. Chris Jones would seem to have an ideal biography to run for governor, a job that's wide open in Arkansas for the first time in eight years. He's both an ordained Baptist, and a nuclear engineer who can talk about his faith as easily as scientific concepts. He's upbeat and personable, as evidenced by his announcement video that quickly went viral nationwide. But there's a catch, though, as there always is in the Deep South. I added that part, as you know. Jones is a Democrat in a state that has gone from red to extremely red in recent years. Trump carried it in 2020 with 62% of the vote. Why doesn't anybody do an audit on that? And, of course, the really big sticker, stickler about this whole candidacy of this guy is that he's black. Where black people account for only 16.5% of the population, and where no African American has ever won statewide office. And thank you for all those people who fought Reconstruction for making that happen. What's more, if he wins his party's nomination, he'll probably have to face a nationally known figure. Oh, God. Sarah Sanders. Formidable, isn't she? You know, she's the former press secretary for Trump and daughter of former Governor Mike Huckabee, that bass player. <laughs> and she's already raised more than $13.6 million. And you got to know the DeVosses are going to be pumping money in her candidacy just like they are with DeSantis. More experienced polls consider the race beyond a long shot, but it represents a change of thinking. And this is what's important about how the Democratic Party can rebuild in heartland states where it has become almost extinct as white rural voters migrated en masse, or en masse, to the GOP. In years past, Democrats in the region usually tried to win over independent and moderate voters by running white establishment candidates. Well, that approach produced little. Now they're hoping to mobilize voters who have not been involved in the process, especially black, Latino, and younger people. Why haven't they been involved? Oh, that's why they've been suppressed by the white apartheid majority. And I'm not kidding. This year, dozens of black Democrats are running for office in places that Trump won easily. Many are political newcomers who were motivated by the protests over police tactics following the killing of George Floyd or advances by black Democratic candidates in once solidly red states like Georgia. 
Jones is one of two black candidates running for Arkansas governor in the May Democratic primary, which also includes an Asian American woman. Two black Democrats are also running for the Senate seat held by Republican John Boozman. African Americans are among the leading Democratic challengers for several Republican-held Senate seats, such as Sherry Beasley in North Carolina and Val Demings in Florida. In Kentucky, Charles Booker is making an uphill bid to unseat Rand Paul. Iowa's Deidre DeGier is the only Democrat challenging Republican Governor Kim Reynolds. Black voters and office holders already hold considerable sway in the Democratic Party in blue states, but some say it's time for American African American candidates to take the lead in attracting new voters elsewhere and elevating top social issues. Associated Press staff bring us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Applebee's has confirmed that an employee of a Missouri-based franchisee has been fired after sending an email speculating that high gas prices and the end of pandemic stimulus money would force employees to work longer hours for lower pay. This is the opinion of an individual, not Applebee's. Kevin Carroll, Applebee's chief operations officer, said in a statement how we got that accent. I don't know. I'm just making it up as I go along. And the franchisee was terminated. uh, And the franchisee terminated was a mid-level worker. And the employee didn't work directly for Applebee's, so they say. Issues arose after someone shared an email last month with Jake Holcomb, who was the manager of an Applebee's restaurant in Lawrence, Kansas. He quit soon after he read the email, which said, As inflation continues to climb and gas prices continue to go up, that means more hours employees will need to work to maintain their current level of living. Holcomb said he printed a couple dozen copies, left them where servers could find them, Uh, The Springfield News leader reported, Then I gave everyone in the restaurant their food for free and we just left. We didn't even close the store, he said, adding that he also shared the email with a friend who posted a screenshot to Reddit on March 21st. The restaurant remained closed the next day and the email began circulating widely online. Kreischer of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. New vehicles sold in the United States will have to average at least 40 miles per gallon of gasoline in 2026, up from about 28 mpg under new federal rules unveiled on Friday that undo a rollback of standards enacted under Donald Trump, which was reported widely here at Netroots Radio. 
The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration said its new fuel economy requirements are the strongest to date and the maximum the industry can achieve over the time period. They will reduce gasoline consumption by more than 220 billion gallons over the life of vehicles compared with the Trump standards. They're expected to decrease carbon dioxide emissions, but not as much as some environmentalists want, and raise new vehicle prices in an industry already pressed by supply chain issues and inflation. Of course, the uh, auto industry just reported their highest profits in history. So much for inflation. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, Arting the Storm. In Infinite Storm, director Malgorzata Zumoshka, director of photography Michael Englert, writer-actor Joshua Rollins in his first produced feature screenplay, congrats, and actor Naomi Watts tell the true story of Pam Bales, who, as a New Hampshire mountain search and rescuer, climbed Mount Washington in November 2010 to memorialize, or brood about, her two deceased daughters. While there, she found a disoriented young man in shorts and tennis shoes, suffering from exposure while an early winter storm settled in on them both. Most of the press is focused on Jumoshka's background as a documentary filmmaker and on Watts working with Bales herself and on their harrowing shoot on a Slovenian mountain in order to quote unquote get it right because it's easy to judge a realistic film's worth by how real it looks. And it's also easy when acting can be a matter of imitation rather than interpretation. However, I'd like to talk about some of the artistry in this film. First off, Jumoshka agreed to do the film if her producer supported her call for no flashbacks. She actually ends up using a handful and I can respect her initial instincts because even though they provide useful background, they took me out of moments I didn't want to be taken out of. Most importantly though, Jumoshka uses a number of two people mid shots and close ups to make this film feel close, which is smart because this is not a film about isolation, it's about a world of people inseparably connected to each other. Even the long establishment shots that show how alone Bales is at her home or on the mountain don't make those places loom or feel overwhelming. They just are, allowing you to catch their starkness or their beauty as befits you. The movie's other themes are what you'd expect, the indomitability of the human spirit, and that one can find resilience and even beauty on the other side of suffering. So does Infinite Storm work? Depends. Are you an ass half-kicked or a mountain half-climbed kind of person? This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As the days get longer and the weather warms, people of all ages will start to spring into action. Spring is a great time to breathe fresh air, stretch your arms and legs, and get physically active outdoors. Lack of physical activity contributes to obesity, heart disease, stroke, and other chronic health conditions. Fortunately, many communities are making it easier and safer to be physically active. Neighborhoods across the country are working together to create more public spaces for walking, running, biking, and other physical activities. Adults should get at least 150 minutes of physical activity each week, and children should get 60 minutes a day. If you find it hard to walk to a local recreation center, park, or playground, Learn how to make your neighborhood a place that makes healthy living easier. Visit makinghealthesier.org for information about ways communities can change to get more people outside and moving. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. This is a message from CDC. After hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods, standing water and excess moisture help mold grow in your home, garage, and other structures. 
When you return to a home that has been flooded, know that you're likely to have mold. Mold puts your family's health at risk. If you have mold growing in your home, you should clean it up and fix other water problems, such as leaks in roofs, walls, or plumbing. Keep your children and pets out of affected areas until you've cleaned. Control moisture in your home to prevent mold growth. To remove mold growth from hard surfaces, use commercial products, soap and water, or a bleach solution of no more than one cup of household laundry bleach in one gallon of water. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Never mix bleach with ammonia or other household cleaners. It will produce dangerous, toxic fumes. Open windows and doors to provide fresh air. For more information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Barry Goldwater, considered a right-wing fringe candidate in 1964, won the Republican presidential nomination by declaring that, quote, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. But the GOP is now way beyond the fringe, declaring that nuttiness in the defense of extremism is no vice. Consider Jenny Thomas. Her recent far-out political effort to overthrow the people's 2020 presidential vote shows that her husband Clarence Thomas, the dogmatic Supreme Court reactionary, is not the nuttiest member of the Thomas household. He's the best known of the duo, but wife Jenny has quietly been moving into the top circle of unhinged political conspiracy activists. Biden's defeat of Trump in 2020 set off this supremely connected partisan like an explosion in a fireworks factory. She spewed out a weeks-long barrage of text messages to Trump's chief of staff demanding that Republicans use the court to stop Congress from certifying Biden's victory. Jenny instructed the White House to, quote, release the Kraken. Huh? Kraken, the name of a mythological sea monster, was used by manic right-wingers as code for a package of kooky lawsuits they hoped judges would use to put Trump back in power. Jenny Thomas was not merely someone babbling free speech opinions, but she was a powerful political plotter actively strategizing to have unelected judges usurp the people's democratic authority. This was too crazy, even for the right-wing Republicans now running the high court. Except for one. Guess who? Yes, despite his obvious conflict of interest, Clarence used his position to try to advance election cases in which his spouse had a personal stake. This is Jim Hightower saying, yet he wasn't punished for violating the ethics code because the U.S. Supreme Court has no ethics code. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Today, we begin a brief series on Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States. Abraham Lincoln is a symbol of democracy. His stirring story of hard-won achievements occupies a primary place in America's heritage. Lincoln's story began in Kentucky on February 12, 1809. Born in a crude one-room log cabin, Abraham was the second child of Thomas and Nancy Hanks Lincoln. His parents were typical pioneers who had traveled west from Virginia to seek opportunity on the frontier. In the fall of 1816, when Abraham was seven years old, his family moved north across the Ohio River to acquire 160 acres of land in the wilderness of southern Indiana. Abraham's mother died in 1817, and his father married Sarah Bush Johnston, a widow from Kentucky who nurtured her stepson's ambition. Although his formal education was sporadic and limited, amounting to less than one year of school, Abraham acquired an abiding love of reading. Many years later, he wrote, A capacity and taste for reading gives access to whatever has been discovered by others. Lincoln's lifelong commitment to learning was his key to self-improvement. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute.
I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1968. This is a day of mourning. Today is the day an assassin's bullet murdered Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he was coming out of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King was in Memphis for a march to support striking sanitation workers. The workers were trying to gain union recognition and safe working conditions. The night before the scheduled march, Dr. King gave his final speech, one that will be long remembered. He urged participation by the congregants, telling them, quote, nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. We've got to see this through, he said, and when we have our march, you need to be there. If it means leaving work, if it means leaving school, be there. Be concerned about your brother. You may not be on strike, but either we go up together or we go down together. He then ended his speech with these prophetic words. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. Less than 24 hours later, Dr. King had given his life to the cause of civil rights and workers' rights. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 50 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of, well, it looks like a high of only about 52 to 54 and we have a steady rain this morning and showers conti- continuing in the afternoon. Winds will be out of the west southwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. It looks like we're getting about a quarter to a half inch of rain today with mostly cloudy skies tonight. Lows in the mid 30s. Winds out of the west at 5 to 10 miles per hour and considerable clouds early tomorrow with some decrease in clouds later in the day with highs in the upper 50s. Winds, light and variable. Confirmed cases of coronavirus continue to rise in Jackson County. And people just don't want to believe anything happened with the pandemic. It's like it never existed. We now stand with at 426,008 confirmed cases and our deceased has risen by one and now stands at 511. Let's see. Okay, scroll down here, and it looks like grass pollen is moderate right outside the window on Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 42 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is moderate at level 5, so take care. Barometric pressure is rising at 29.93 inches. Visibility is down to 4 miles, and relative humidity is at 98%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 57 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 51 and cloudy. Rome is 60 degrees and cloudy. Oh, they just changed it to partly cloudy. Kiev, though, is 41 degrees Fahrenheit and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 63 and clear. Hong Kong is 67 and fair. Tokyo is 48 degrees with showers in the vicinity. Sydney, Australia 
is 66 and clear. San Francisco, California is 51 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is a crisp 46 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Buddhist Dacus of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. Lithuania says it has cut itself off entirely of gas imports from Russia, apparently becoming the first of the EU's 27 nations using Russian gas to break its energy dependence upon Moscow. Lithuania managed to reduce imports of Russian gas to zero on Saturday, a move seen as a milestone in achieving energy independence in the former Soviet Republic of 2.8 million people. We are the first EU country among Gazprom supply countries to gain independence from Russian gas supplies. And this is the result of a multi-year coherent energy policy and timely infrastructure decisions. Minister of Energy Danias Kivas said Lithuanian President Naseda posted an upbeat tweet on his account and urged other European nations to do the same. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Sammy Magdi of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Muslim holy month of Ramadan, when the faithful fast from dawn to dusk began at sunrise on Saturday, in much of the Middle East where Russia's invasion of Ukraine has sent energy and food prices soaring. The conflict cast a pall over Ramadan when large gatherings over meals and family celebrations are a tradition. Many in the Southeast Asian nation of Indonesia plan to start observing Sunday, and some Shiites in Lebanon, Iran, and Iraq were also marking the start of Ramadan a day later. Muslims follow a lunar calendar, and a moon sighting methodology can lead to different countries declaring the start of Ramadan a day or two apart. Muslim-majority nations, including Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Syria, Sudan, and the United Arab Emirates, had declared the month would begin on Saturday morning. Jordan, a predominantly Sunni country, also said the first of Ramadan, first day of Ramadan would be on Sunday in a break from following Saudi Arabia. The kingdom said the Islamic religious authority was unable to spot the crescent moon, indicating the beginning of the month. Many had hoped for a more cheerful Ramadan after the coronavirus pandemic blocked the world's two billion Muslims from many rituals the past two years. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, however, millions of people in the Middle East are now wondering where their next meals will come from. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 